Hi, this is Angelo John Lewis for the Diversity and Spirituality Network podcast, which we've taken to calling the Sacred Inclusion Network lately. And in case you're not familiar with us, our network is an emerging community of people who are actively exploring the integration of diversity and spirituality. Now, we all have different opinions as to what that looks like, but for me personally, I see sacred inclusion as nothing less than a sacred path in and of itself. Today, it's my privilege to interview Stacy Bowden, who's a guide, facilitator, ceremonialist, hands-on energy worker, and author of the book, Turning Dead Ends Into Doorways. Stacy integrates spiritual transformation with practical guidance for people to develop courage, connection, resilience, and whatever they need to navigate life better and to feel more peaceful inside. Mm. She has a master's in women's spirituality from the California Institute of Integral Studies. She also has over 10 years of non-ordinary states consciousness training through the Center of Sacred Studies. Her group facilitation includes Seven Directions Dance Ceremony, a technique she founded in 2002, and she leads dance ceremonies for the public, ongoing women's groups, and weekend retreats throughout the Bay Area. Stacy, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for having me here. I'm honored to sit with you. Well, it's a pleasure. Um, Stacy, I always like to ask people to sort of get our bearings. So tell me a little bit about your own spiritual or religious uh, background. Um, I was born Jewish. So my, both, all of my parents, um, our bloodlines are Jewish and I identify, um, strongly, I would say, uh, culturally, but I never felt very connected with the religion of Judaism. Um, my mother on my mother's side, I actually have three parents, two, two moms and a dad. And I was raised in San Francisco. Um, and on my mom's side, I was raised in an atmosphere of, um, feminism and kind of strong women's community in the early seventies in San Francisco. And, uh, my father is, uh, a very, a spiritual man and a meditator. So I would say that I, I connected with spirituality through my dad's side and the more, um, and, and kind of women's empowerment through my mom's. Mm. Now, for those of us on the East Coast, it's a little bit unusual, maybe not so much these days, to have someone to study women's spirituality. Give me a sense as to what prompted you to do that, and uh, let's just start from there, and then I'll ask you some questions about it. Um, what prompted me was I, I graduated from actually an East Coast college, and I came back to San Francisco, and I studied. Um, mediation and entered law school with the intention to become a mediator. And I had been developing my spirituality and kind of feeling a call to spirituality, probably starting at 15 or so, but it was very much an on the side thing. Um, as, as my college work kind of continued, I started connecting with teachers like Starhawk and um, kind of more earth-based spirituality, feminine spirituality. And then I entered law school and I absolutely hated it. It was, <laughs> not, it was not a good fit for me. I could not, I did not do well, despite being a pretty straight A student, mostly throughout high school and college. I did horribly. And I somehow found a pamphlet one day on the, you know, talking about CIS, CIS California, Institute of Integral Studies had this women's spirituality, and it's also a philosophy and religion degree, so it's both. And somehow that became my fantasy that if I would just leave law school, this would be the thing I would enjoy studying. Uh, and so I did, in fact, after a year, couldn't do it anymore, left law school. And within a week of that, I applied and was granted entrance into the Women's Spirituality Program. So, uh, I guess this is a broad question, Stacey, but um, I'm curious, so what, what is your, do you sense a difference between women's spirituality and men's spirituality? And if so, what is it? Well, what I would say is that it's, it's uh, so for me, what I, what I would connect women's spirituality with feminine wisdom with more earth-based spirituality. And 
to me, I don't know what a men's spirituality is, except for I would equate that more with, with more patriarchal religion. Um, it's less about specific gender identity and more about how does one move through life. And so for me, I felt a call to study women's spirituality because it connected me with a, another way to frame culture, more back in the day of you know, matrilineal cultures and it connected me with holding uh, holding spirituality as an earth-based practice that included the cycles of life and the seasons and really holding life as something to be in relationship with as opposed to have power over and control. So that's how I would frame it. So I know this is everyday stuff for you, but give me a sense as to what you mean for um, maybe people that um, don't have the experience. What do you mean by earth-centered spirituality exactly? So, you know, earth-based spirituality to me is valuing the elements, valuing the directions, valuing the earth as something that is alive and vibrant and that we connect with, with within ourselves and within our daily lives. And so it's it's about not trying to have to dominate anything and control. It's that same idea of power over versus relationship with. And so there are a lot of different kinds of earth based practices anywhere from, let's say, you know, pagan spirituality to Wicca, which is actually a form of pagan spirituality to indigenous ways. There are many different um, indigenous ways of healing all over the planet from original peoples uh, that are earth-based. And so since I am a, you know, a white woman of Jewish descent, I, I am not, you know, I do not practice uh, 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 indigenous spirituality, but I do connect with the earth very strongly. And I believe that we all have the capacity and ability to connect with the earth because we are living on this planet. So that's why I say earth-based and and on and kind of identify in that way as opposed to other ways, other names. I love the title of your book, um, Turning Dead Ends into Doorways. And I didn't put the, the uh, sort of subtitle in there, How to Grow Through li Whatever Life Throws Your Way. That's just a beautiful title for a book. And it says a lot. And I, I just want to challenge you. Give me some example of how you've done that in your own life, you know, turning dead ends to doorways. Can, can you give me an example? Is that hopefully not too challenging? Oh my, I, yeah. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm grateful that I was able to name my book and I'm grateful that my publisher um, respected me enough to work with me um, to, to come up with that title. And uh, well, a, a case in point for sure, leaving for me, law school would have probably been a dead end and opening to another way of living my life because I always, for me for me the decision to leave law school and um, enter women's spirituality program as well as at the same time within a week I found my husband and I had just gotten married and we were living in San Francisco and he was actually starting a graduate degree this is back in 1994 and within a week of me quitting law school, we moved to Half Moon Bay because he was doing his graduate work down in Santa Cruz, and I was going to be um, enrolling in the program in San Francisco for women's spirituality. And within three days of moving to Half Moon Bay, I, leaving this dead end, I walked into a store called Onesha Healing Tools, um, which is... Uh, which is where I ended up apprenticing. It's a healing store. And I, the first person I met there um, was a woman who was, was in a program at ITP. And I, at that moment, I hadn't quite decided whether or not I wanted to um, enroll in, in the women's spirituality program or enroll in a psych program. And she was um, attending a, the psych program I was considering. And the other co-owner was attending the women's spirituality program in San Francisco. So that is an example to me of what happens when we can really let go of our agenda, move from a more mental place, move down into our heart, start to follow energy in daily life, and how, and how doing that can present incredible opportunities um, that we never imagined with our little selves, with our egos, can appear in our daily life to facilitate an opening, a rebirth, a doorway. And it started back then. So for you, it was, it, was, it was going to the store is almost like a choice. And you, you, you followed the energy of this, this um, woman who's teaching. And I guess probably her 
aura that you were attracted to. And I guess the rest is history because that's a kind of a, a very um, kind of concise statement. But, um, but, but that's an example of what you're talking about. Yes, I was feeling, and I had just quit law school and I was feeling a little scared and alone and I wasn't sure what was next. And then my husband and I were literally walking around this new place and all of a sudden I saw a sign that said, Onesha Healing Tools. And I said, what's that? And we walked into the store and my husband looked at me, we looked around. I had a lot of interest in, you know, what was there. And he said, well, you need to come back here when you have a few hours. (laughs) And so I did. And then when I came back, it was the same person. And that's when we had this conversation. And so she was in one program, the co-owner was in the other, and I was literally deciding between the two. And so I started talking with them and gathering information. And that's how I made my choice. So I want to explore this a little bit more. Um, your book talks about eight teachers to help you face the unknown in, in daily life. Mm-hmm. And um, can you first introduce us to these eight teachers and give me a sense of how you've used one of those teachers to guide you in your life? So what happened was, is that I, I left, so I left law school. I start, I found this place, Onesha Healing Tools. I started going to grad school at the same time. And um, through that, through that, through that doorway, I started to connect with the Center for Sacred Studies. So I spent about four years um, at Onesha Healing Tools. And then my teachers, teachers um, had a mystery school called the Stargate Mystery School. And, and I began studying with them and I began studying earth-based ways. I began studying ceremony. I began studying non-ordinary states of consciousness work. And they introduced me to something called following energy. And what following energy is, is learning how to let go, learning how to step into the unknown and learning how to pay attention what, with, to what shows up inside of ourselves, inside of our bodies and in, inside of daily life and to kind of hold focus for something that we're following. So I spent many years studying that at the Center for Sacred Studies, and then I graduated. And then I started, at that point, I had two kids, and we moved uh, up back to San Francisco. And um, I started seeing clients. At that point, I was doing energy work. I I was starting to sit with people. And as I sat with people, uh, uh, the people that showed up were feisty, mostly women, and they didn't know anything about earth-based ways of healing. And, and they didn't understand what I was talking about when I started talking about following energy. So what began to happen is through sitting with mostly women and starting to hold groups, I began to have these conversations with people about what does it mean to follow energy? What does that look like inside of ourselves and daily life? And that conversation lasted for probably about eight years or so. And, and, and throughout that time, I began to notice that certain things would appear when we started talking about following energy. Certain teachers be, would appear. And so when it came time to um, write a book proposal or to, and that's a whole story unto itself of how I even got a book deal is the story of following energy. Um, my question was, how do I teach people to follow energy in written form? And I was literally at my kitchen table. How am I going to do this? And I sat down and I wrote a list of these eight teachers. And through growing a relationship with those eight daily teachers and archetypal teachers, that can show you how to learn how to, how to follow energy and navigate life differently. So those eight teachers, is it okay if I say them now? Or? Yeah, I, I want you to um, maybe say, say who they are and maybe just give an example of maybe, maybe you or how one of your clients can sort of have used them as sort of an archetypical um, way of developing a path. Yeah, so the eight teachers um, that I arrived at, and I'm not saying that, the, that this is the only way to follow energy or that there aren't many more life teachers. It's simply that these were the ones that I noticed over and over and over and over again for a long period of time. And so they have been my starting point, I would say. Um, so these eight teachers are fear, awareness, choice, body, intuition, energy, intention and surrender Mm. so these are the eight teachers and uh, and i i feel like fear is a huge 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 teacher of learning how to follow energy often because fear is what um help helps us realize we're stuck fear is what stands at the you know often blocks the doorway of change the threshold and kind of shouts like don't do it don't go any further Mm. 
Fear tries to keep us safe and small. And so fear is a constant teacher that I work with both inside of myself and with clients all of the time. And the way that I work with fear, which is an earth-based way, is instead of trying to kill fear or make fear wrong, what I do is I help facilitate a conversation with fear. Mm-hmm. I, I invite my clients to, to study fear, to begin to become curious about what their fears are. Not because fear is easy and not because we always want to listen to the fears, but because if we can learn what our fears are, we can actually learn how to navigate around them and through them. And then fears can actually become a source of awareness, which is the second teacher in my book. So that's well, an example. Well, let's just stick to fear for a minute. Can you give me a sense as to what maybe a conversation might have looked like with maybe one of your clients or even with yourself? Sure. Um, so if someone is coming in and, uh, you know, first it's, first it's holding space for someone around, let's say they want to get, let's say someone wants to, wants to change their job, okay? Uh, but, and, and all of a sudden they, they, can't, they, they can't move forward, they're spinning, their thoughts are spinning. I will simply say, okay, let's, let's stop for, mo- for a moment and breathe into your heart. Now, what is your heart feeling right now? what's happening inside of you. And then usually, honestly, fear is, fear is pretty talkative. <laughs> fear, fear is pretty talkative. So it's not hard to get fear talking to us, honestly. Uh, that's one way. It's just simply saying like, what are you afraid of? What, what, what's the stuckness about for you? And people can go there pretty easily. Another way that I work with, I also um, am an energy healer. So in addition to my individual session work, having a component of talking and listening and sharing, there's also a component of lying down on a massage table, fully clothed and going inside and closing, closing one's eyes and going inside oneself. And so one of the things that we might also do during the second part of a session is someone would close their eyes and go inside. And I might say like, all right, if we were going to invite, if you were going to go into a natural setting, Um, and, you know, see yourself moving into a natural setting and invite this fear to come forward, what would it look like? What might it say? You know, what what might this fear want to show you? And so I work with guided imagery with people, which I can do in person as well as on the phone and through Zoom calls and all that. And they go inside and and we begin to um, explore what a relationship with fear might look like. And it turns out that fear comes as a cast of characters, a cast of characters in our lives, anywhere from silly things that someone said to us when we were eight to, um, to limiting belief systems that came in later through an experience to deep lineage. Fears can be passed on through lineage, things that our parents told us or our grandparents told us. Maybe they even exist in our bloodlines. And then fear comes through trauma. You know, the, our life history of hard things that we've had can exist uh, through fear and express itself as a fear in our lives. So part of what I do, I actually do quite extensive fear work with people because I, because I am very interested in seeing what is the landscape of all of these fears and how they're showing up regarding a specific life issue. And the more that we get to know as many fears want, who, you know, want to come forward, the more we can learn how to move through them, the more we can learn how to become aware of them, the more we can learn how to make conscious choices in the face of these fears so that these fears don't stop us. Um, they become, they, they actually were learning how to get out, uh, move around them and move forward in life and continue to evolve and grow and change and all of that. Now, I know you've done extensive studies around uh, sacred states or non-ordinary states of consciousness. Can you give me some sense as to uh, the importance of being able to access these, sp- these states for spiritual growth? And I understand that this is not the, an only path, path but um, apparently this is something that you, you use and you're very familiar with. So I'm just curious as to your thoughts about that. Yes. Um, you know, with deep respect to psychotherapy, and, I, and it's actually, first of all, and it's changed so much in the last 20 years. So this is back in the day, 20 years ago, when 
becoming a therapist, a psychotherapist meant that you couldn't touch. It meant that you, it meant that a lot of rules and structures, which there wasn't somatic therapy the way there is today or expressive arts therapy. But back in the day, it was very structured. And, um, and quite honestly, starting at 15, my hands woke up. I had a call to do hands-on healing work. So, so, I was, so from a very young age, I was aware of energy, of subtle energy as something that was alive and that wanted to move through me with people. And so, there, so, so when it came, and I also knew I wanted to be of service, and I also knew I wanted to be of service to you know, human transformation and consciousness at a young age. And so, so, so as I began to, you know, work at Onesha Healing Tools and do my own personal work, my, my abilities, the mediumship began to develop um, in a very natural, organic way and altered states work or non-ordinary states work of, you know, of consciousness work was just part of how I developed myself. So, so for example, breath work, I'm a facilitator of a certain kind of breath work called Maya Tree breath work. Um, I did something called study, st subtle, subtle body restructuring. I did a six-month um, apprenticeship in that. I started to explore guided imagery very much based on my teachers and how they worked with it, but also on following my own vision. And then in the last 20 years, I've learned how to hold space for people that way uh, is to help them access their own imagery. Dance is a form of... of um, a non-ordinary, you can enter into a trance state. And I think it's possible that like yoga, yoga can be a form of um, non-ordinary states of consciousness work too. So there are many, many different forms. And it's just something that showed up on my path that made sense to me because for me, I, I believe that in order for us to heal at a, a cellular level, we need to address energy. We can't just talk. Mm -hmm. Talking will only get us so far, and then we need how to learn how to work the energy of something. Some people do that through meditation. Uh, so meditation could be another form of, of, of entering an alpha state or entering another state of, of consciousness, right? So these are the ones that showed up for me. You know, I've always liked the, one of my favorite movies is The Matrix, you know? And mm -hmm. um, one of the, I guess, the thesis of The Matrix um, is in a sense that many of us are walking around in trance. And there are ways, even for ordinary people, to enter um, what might be called non-ordinary states of, of awareness or um, consciousness, basically, to be able to transform what ordinary consciousness looks like. Um, is that something that sounds familiar to you? Absolutely. I love The Matrix, too. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, the end scene where you realize what it was in that first movie, it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yes, I, I mean, I believe that subtle realms, subtle energy is real, and they're now starting, I don't, I don't know all the physics of it, but they're now finally starting to show that it's real, and I have experienced it as uh, an energy worker where I can be working with a client, and they're, they're in kind of one territory of their life and exploring something, and then they move to another, and their energy field looks a certain way, and then they, they imagine something else or go somewhere else, and all of a sudden, it, compl it, it completely changes. Their whole field changes. And, and so I, I'm a big believer in, in learning how to work with subtle energy and learning and that altered states work. I mean, frankly, birth is an altered state work, mm. too. And I'm also a birth doula. So, um, so really, it's about step. And it's as old as time. Like, it's as old as time. It's, it's so much older than our, than our current civilization. It's learning how to move out of of what we consider to be this reality and moving into some, some other place where, you know, where things come alive and talk to us and consciousness can come alive and talk to us and listen to us. And it can be a relationship that we can learn and grow and expand um, to support us. And for me, it's not about, it's about, I'm really interested in, in focused on the practical and the, and the spiritual. So for me, it's about practical spirituality. So I'm not just interested in uh, facilitating a mystical experience to check out. I'm interested in facilitating a mystical experience where people can check in, where people can begin to um, gather whatever it is that they need to let go of, whatever it is that they need to, so that they can feel more um, peaceful inside, whole inside, so that they can make better decisions, so that they can be better parents, 
I'm not interested in something that is going to kind of be escapism, but more about how do we become more awake? And frankly, how do we develop our capacity as adults? How do we become adults in our, in our bodies, in our lives, um, in service to ourselves and each other and hopefully the planet? I want to talk to you, Stacey, about your work with ceremony. Um, um, this is, um, I don't want to say it's unique to you, but this is a, a specific thing that you do that I don't see a lot of people doing. And um, we're going to talk about it maybe in, a little bit in depth, but just, just to, begin, just to get, start us off, can you give me a sense as to how you got involved in ceremony work? And then we'll talk about the specifics of it. Yes. Um, once again, deep gratitude to Onesha Healing Tools and also to the Center for Sacred Studies. So the Center for Sacred Studies has been um, around for at least 30 years and, and, and the spiritual director is currently Darlene Hunter, but it was originally founded by um, one of, they're all my teachers, Joe T and um, her husband, Russell Park. And essentially, they ha the Center for Sacred Studies has been dedicated to working directly with indigenous people and original peoples and the planet and serving that consciousness for many, many, many years. And so, so they are, my teachers are the teachers that have studied with original peoples and received, you know, through, through dedicating decades, received the blessing of holding ceremonies. Um, certain native ways, you know, they work with ceremonies all from all over the world and they have been granted to do so directly by indigenous peoples um, because, they, because they've grown relationship, out of relationship. And so when I began to study with them um, as part of uh, this four-year altered states, non-ordinary states of consciousness program, we would, we would, hold you know sit and experience ceremony together that was part of the training that we received and then through uh, i just it, i loved it i love sitting in ceremony i i love how ceremony um brings whatever is on the edge of our consciousness and focalizes it and shows it to us so that we can learn from it and so after i graduated after we were um gifted with carrying certain elements of ceremony on not not anything that was from a not not specific original ways that can only be handed by original peoples but certain elements like working with an altar or working with candles or you know working with certain herbs or grounding so there were certain ceremonial elements that that my teachers uh felt called to connect with dance because dance was from a, from a young age was a, a, a very big source of healing in my life when I was about 15 years old. And um, often we would be at ceremonies through my teachers where they were very long extended ceremonies and um, we were asked to hold a point of stillness, which is an incredible study that I highly recommend. And that there would be times in these ceremonies where the energy would get big and my body- <laughs> Start moving. Would wanna move it. And so a dear friend of mine at the time, who's still a good friend, um, she and I began to explore that together. She was also in the program. And we just began to dance in her living room and dance in her backyard. And it was natural for us to, we, we weren't interested in going to a bar. We, we had young children at the time. And it was natural for us to bring in our ceremony ways because I believe that if we're going to open to the invisible world, um, creating a conscious sacred container is really important. Just like, you know, I lived in San Francisco for, for 25 years and I don't leave my door unlocked. If I'm going to be entering into a relationship with the mystery, then I want to call in as much um, safety and protection and awareness as I can. And, and the, the different ceremonial ways that my teacher, our teachers gave us to me represent safety and consciousness. And so, so therefore what evolved after dancing and, and, you know, bringing in all of these elements was a dance ceremony that got born in 2002. And that dance ceremony is called Seven Directions. It's gone through a lot of evolution and it's been alive for 17 years and it continues to be um, my spiritual practice and a deep love and a deep teacher in my life. And it has grown me in ways and held me in ways that I am so grateful for. Now, I know, Stacey, this is not, um, it's, it's not an exclusive womanist practice, um, but I remember in conversation you were telling me um, that um, 
many of the circles that you have done have been women's circles. And you're also sharing the story of what happened um, around a specific, around the, around the election of our a recent 2016 um, thing, which might have um, catapulted to a different level. Um, but I wonder if you could, if you have a sense as to why um, these kind of ceremonies might be particularly useful for women or what, what calls, um, is it simply that it's an earth centered practice or, or, or what? what, what is your sense about that? I, I know I'm kind of making these connection women ceremony, which maybe is a little bit artificial, but what's your sense of it? Well, uh, first of all, I would say that when it comes to, let's say in indigenous practices, I, I don't presume to know but I would not necessarily say that that is female, uh, you know, only women. What I, what I can tell you as someone who's been holding dance ceremony for 17 years it is, is that it has predominantly attracted women, at least for me in my world. And I've talked to other somatic practitioners um, who, hold, who hold different kinds of body movement. And we kind of like, yeah, it's mostly women. Like, what is up with that? So, so just to say in the beginning of Seven Directions in 2002, we danced. It was you know, not just women, it was also our, you know, male friends and, and, and we held many circles like that for, for years. And then starting in 2010, um, there was a vision that landed for me and the co-facilitator at the time of, of really starting to hold women's dance ceremony circles. And so, so therefore starting in 2010, we launched these, it's basically a five month um, process where you dance once a month and it was a closed women's circle. And I, I can't tell you why. All I can tell you is that when we did that, it crystallized something with Seven Directions. And at the time, this was 2010, there wasn't, there wasn't the same kind of dance practices that we have now. Um, so it was unusual. And it's still unusual in that it's a ceremony. It's a dance ceremony. It's not, it's, 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 it's a strong container and we invoke certain things and we hold things in a, in a sacred way. But at the time it was pretty unusual. And so we had people, we were started in San Francisco and we had people driving from far away to come to this. And within a year we had grown to a second circle in Berkeley. And um, there was, it was something of, honestly, I didn't, I, I wasn't aware of what it was until later, like what, it took me a long time to realize what is it about this that's calling women forward. And I think, I think after doing, I'm now it's still alive. Seven Directions and Women's Seven Directions is still alive. So I've studied it, and we hold them ten months out of the year. So it's something I've been studying for a really long time. And I think that there, what was radical that I didn't know was women coming together to dance for themselves to women coming together to experience pleasure in their own bodies, women coming together to dance not as a performance or to attract anybody, um, women coming together to be free on the dance floor. Like this isn't about aerobics. It's just about having room to express whatever wants to come through us. And, and that really it's more of a solo practice. It's not, Seven Directions is, it, is not what we call a horizontal practice. It's more vertical, meaning you're mostly dancing with yourself. And having the freedom to get really loud and big and express our power and have a voice and shake our hips and not be and, and, and have that be okay is rather, it turns out it's rather radical. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't know it at the time. I was just following this call, I was following the energy. Now, I know that um, you've developed your own unique style with this, um, but I, I, was, I was curious about one thing. You, you mentioned that a lot of your teachers had um, learned things about ceremonies from indigenous people. And as you know, in the sort of circles that we travel in, um, there's a lot of conversation about cultural appropriation and how to do things um, in, in an appropriate way. What is your sense about that? Well, it's, it's highly important to me to be respectful, which is why my teachers, you know, my, why I make it really clear that my teachers um, have spent decades working directly with indigenous, indigenous people and have been handed ceremonies um, directly, you know, from teachers all, you know, from, from different places all over the world, and that we have been taught to you know, the way they hold those ceremonies is that you hold each one in its own way. You don't mix them. You follow it. You know, there's a certain um, template that you do in a certain way out of respect for the teaching and the prayer that was given to you. And that I make it really clear that I am not, you know, an indigenous teacher. 
and that actually I'm more women's spirituality, which is more earth based and more kind of in the goddess realm. And, um, and within that, uh, you know, I, I believe that, you know, that, that, that we all, that, that earth belongs to all of us and that, um, and that it's important for us to have consciousness and awareness. And I'm usually the first one in a, and, and that seven directions in particular is not, um, it doesn't exist in terms of a, uh, an original way. There's no such thing as seven directions. I was, I have a dear friend of mine who is a sun dancer who has dedicated his life to native ways and been adopted by a native tribe. And, and I remember when the name of seven directions came in, I was so nervous and I called him and I was like, I'm like, I don't, Oh my God, is this okay? This is what's coming in. It's like seven directions. And he's like, Oh honey, don't worry about it. Like, in native ways, there's no such thing. It's four directions. It's the four directions. Um, and it, it, there's no such thing. So I'm like, okay, thank you. Thank you. Because it's really important to me that we, um, that we, that, that we are respectful and there is a level of appropriation that is absolutely not okay. And at the same time, I, I feel very fortunate to get to hold the point that I hold um, with, with mostly white women on how do we call in the sacred and be in the sacred and be in our power and um, have consciousness and get behind these other traditions and learn how to follow and be respectful that way. And so I feel really grateful that I've been able to hold that point as a white woman for a long time. Hmm. Uh, I, two more questions to ask you, Stacey. Um, you're obviously a white woman. And you've also been exposed to, um, you know, lots of what I'll call esoteric kinds of traditions, uh, for lack of a better word. Um, but, uh, and I'm wondering if you, if you, if you see a, a point of connection between maybe your Jewish spiritual roots and the kind of things that you've been, been involved with more recently. Uh, um, yeah, because I am Jewish and there is, a, and there is a whole thing, right? We are the other white people. <laughs> you know, it's true, because if you look at what's happening in the world right now, um, you know, in America, like there's a lot of anti-Semitism that's really on the rise. And, and so, you know, we're not exempt and in that way. And, and frankly, my, on my dad's side, they come, we come from the Holocaust. My, so anyway, that's a whole other story, but my father's first memory is coming into this country and seeing Ellis Island. So, mm -hmm. so the pogroms are very recent in my bloodline. Um, I, I, I would say that, that, that there's a deep spirituality that I experienced with my great grandmother, who I was lucky to know until she was, I was in my thirties when she died. And, um, it wasn't really expressed so much by going to synagogue, but more about how she took care of people and how she was known to be the matriarch of our family and a force of healing. Um, there's a, for me, there's a cultural identity of, of, of strength and power that women in the Jewish line that I've experienced that lives on in my spirituality. And I have to say that when I go into a Jewish temple, I have a really hard time. My, my personality has a really hard time because I can, I feel a lot of constriction there. Um, and I don't identify with it. And in, in general, I don't do well with most patriarchal religion because I, I just, it doesn't land with me. Um, but I do feel, and I feel, so there have been times where there's been things happening. I mean, I have, I have statues in this and I think, oh my God, you know, I'm a, an idol worshiper and my ancestors would not be happy about that. And I also need to trust that, that, um, that, that there is a spirit of learning and growing and caring for others that comes for sure through my Jewish identity. Mm. Last question, uh, Stacey. Um, I ask everybody this, so you're not immune. Uh, I personally consider this a, a fairly confusing time, you know, and um, I think it's very important for just pretty much anybody to do some sort of self-care type of things just to sort of keep themselves centered and grounded in the light, whatever terminology you like to use. Just curious what your practice is, your daily practice is. Um, well, first of all, I'm very fortunate. Huh? If any. Oh, I have many. <laughs> First of all, um, I, I've been fortunate to be um, in, in a relationship with my husband for 30 years. 
And so the, the time and the connection and being in a conscious relationship um, with my soulmate really helps me. I love actually one of our practices is I like my morning coffee. We get to have coffee visits and that's a form of self care for me. Um, and then dance ceremony for sure is a, a deep form of self care for me. Singing. I love to sing. Um, I love ceremony and deep talks with friends, lean in moments. Uh, remembering to laugh is really important. Uh, music is huge in my life. Listening and holding space and getting to be of service is actually something that really fills me up. So getting to do my healing work, which is a privilege, uh, actually is also one of the ways that I take care of myself. It, it's one of the ways that I show up to take care of what's happening right now in this culture, which I actually believe we are at a moment right now where something is dying, the paradigm is dying, and we're entering into, we're, it's not dead yet, so we're in the death process now, and so we're moving, I feel like part of what I'm here to help support is that place between the death and the letting go, which is actually a point that I hold well through the process of surrender into the unknown, which is the, the mystery, the numinous darkness, and then moving into rebirth. And so that's part of what I'm here to help support through not only all of my healing work, but also um, how I live my life and talk about it and share it and how I hold space for others. And all of that keeps me sane. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Um, I, I just want to close out by telling people a little bit about, about our network, and then I'll say formally goodbye to you. And first of all, I want to thank you for you know being my guest. You've, you had a lot to say that uh, I'll have to listen to again, and hopefully I'll have a, I will have a chance to share it, and other, hopefully other people can you know, can gravitate towards it. And I'll, I'll, I'll post in the show notes um, a listing to your, your, your um, dancing tree. Um, website. Yeah. And actually, before you say that, I forgot to say that, I, that I'm in the, the, just a shameless plug that actually I'm going to be in the process of launching my own podcast called Turning Dead Ends into Doorways, where I'm inviting people to come on and spend a half an hour with me where they share a real life issue. And I actually hold space for them and we learn how to let go and follow energy. So I would love to extend that invitation um, to people if they feel called to come and sit with me. So I just wanted to put that out there and then say thank you so much. So thank you. This has been a real pleasure. Don't say goodbye yet. I'm going to, I'm okay, going to just do a little plug. I <laughs> uh, just want to say those of you that want to know more about our network, there's a couple of ways you can get involved. The simplest way is to go on our private Facebook page, look for diversity and spirituality. Another way is that the third Saturday of every month, we do an online community exploration you can find information about that by going to our, our page and uh, looking under events. And finally, if you really like the podcast, you want to support it, um, you can do so by going to patreon.com, looking for diversity and spirituality.com, and you can do so. Um, Stacey Bowden, it's been a, been a wonderful, it's been a priv privilege to get to know a little bit about your work, and I'm happy to share it. And um, I'll let people know how they can get in contact with you. Thank you so much. It's really awesome. Thank you for, for this experience. Fantastic.